And that's what climate change is about. It is literally, not figuratively, a clear and present danger. We are in the beginning of a mass extinction. The ability of CO2 to do the heavy work of creating a climate catastrophe is almost nil at this point. The price of oil has been artificially elevated to the point of insanity. That's not how you power a modern industrial system. The ultimate goal of this renewable energy you know, plan is to reach the exact same point that we're at now. You know who's tried that? Germany. Seven straight days of no wind for Germany. Uh, their factories are shutting down. They really do act like weather didn't happen prior to like 1910. Today is Friday. It is indeed Friday, and thank you again for joining us here on Climate Change Roundtable. This is number 64 in a series. And today we're going to talk about climate change related to hurricanes. And, you know, hurricanes is one of those favorite things that alarmists are talking about that are just always out in the news saying hurricanes are getting worse and so forth and so on. So we have um, our usual guest today, Linnea who's with us, uh, and also Stanley Goldenberg, who is a federal meteorologist and uh, who is responsible for creating the hurricane outlooks that uh, come from NOAA. He's partly responsible for it, that come out every year. And um, welcome, everybody. Thanks. Too bad Sterling couldn't be here today, but he's on vacation, a very well-earned one, I think. So he's he's doing fine. Yep, good. So, um, I, you know, Sterling deserves a rest. He works really hard, and he's been a great participant in this show, but he's he's uh, off enjoying much-needed R&R. &R. Uh, Stanley, how are you doing today? I'm doing great and glad to be with you and announcing the outlook for the upcoming season. Okay, cool. Um, and um, I want to just say that uh, we appreciate you coming on here to talk about this stuff. Uh, you know, the hurricane alarmism is just off the scale a lot of times, and we'll get to that in a second. But before we do that, I want to talk about something really fantastic that happened this week in the climate arena. The uh, Supreme Court of the United States struck down the EPA. No, no, smacked down the EPA. They killed Waters of the United States, which is a draconian law not really a law, but an edict from bureaucracy that was basically preventing landowners who might have a puddle on their property that, you know, a seasonal spring puddle with maybe some fairy shrimp in it or something like that. They struck this down and basically said, it's not something that you can do as an organization. You cannot control private landowners' use of their own land. You cannot restrict their use of it. You can't put, you know, you know sanctions on it. It's a huge win for freedom in the United States. And I just wanted to bring it up because, you know, we fight constantly here at the Huntington Institute to try to push back on these sorts of things that happen in the government. You know, we push back on the, the, the bad temperature data that's being produced by temperature stations that are corrupted. We push back on laws. We push back on edicts and bureaucracy. So this is a huge win. So I wanted to bring it to everyone's attention. Right, and I want to point out too, the Washington Post is reporting it incorrectly. They're, they of have course. been reporting it that it was a 5-4 decision. It was actually 9-0. to zero. Um, The 5-4 comes from a disagreement with the opinion that was written up uh, afterwards, not the actual ruling itself. So there was a unanimous um, thought from the Supreme Court that the in the case of Sackett versus the EPA, which is a family trying to build a house and property that they bought, and it turned out that there was a like ephemeral puddle situation that the EPA was claiming feeds into some bit of water that feeds into another bit of water that feeds into a river, which, um, you know, it, it's kind of an extension of that whole, you know, there's no safe level of tampering with uh, the environment idea. And so now the family is able to build the house on their property after like more than a year of legal battles, uh, as much fun as that probably was. Um, and uh, yeah, and, and this is also going to help us with several other lawsuits that were going through the courts 
that all kind of hinged on what Sackett versus EPA would end up uh, coming down to. So this is a big win for us. It is. It's huge. It's huge. And it points out that we can push back against this climate insanity. It just takes a long time. It takes a lot of effort and it takes consistency. And I encourage every one of you who's watching our show right now, if you get the opportunity, write letters to the editor. Write letters to your congressman and senator. Write letters to your local representatives. When they start pushing this climate insanity, where they're trying to restrict your personal freedoms for fear of, you know, destroying the planet, which is not going to happen, has not happened, will not happen. It's all based on model hype and other things that are just not, well, you know the story there. Okay, so what we're going to do now is first talk about the 2022 hurricane season, because last year, about this time, NOAA came out with an edict basically saying they are going to have, a, we're going to have this big hurricane season last year. And then what happened? Well, nothing. <laughs> Slowest start in 30 years. And, you know, it just, uh, it just went down the tube. So the, the predictions that NOAA made about these, you know, increased hurricanes just disappeared. They'd never materialized. And as we went through, the whole process, it got worse, and it got worse, and it got worse. Um, and it set records for lack of activity. Uh, by the end of the season, we had, uh, you know, virtually, the, I think it was, uh, Stanley, the, the lowest hurricane season in, what, like a, uh, two decades, something like that? Not quite. I'll get into all that when I share. Okay. Got to balance the statements a little bit, but go ahead. Well, what I was going to say is that a lot of the hype about last year was kind of media generated or media taking predictions that were going out and spinning them up as like certainties or as, um, you know, claiming that they were going to be a lot worse than what the actual claims were saying. But that's kind of something that we see all the time. And that's something that we cover at Climate Realism constantly, is that the media will take a scientific report or a, um, a paper or something that comes out. And regardless of the scientific um, rigor of the paper, a lot of times they're not very good papers, um, the media will take it and they will say, this is proof that we are suffering huge damages from climate change. This is what's projected to happen. Um, and they, they kind of take it and run with it. But I'm sure that Stan can <laughs> talk about that. <laughs> right. let, me, let me balance it right away. And I'll keep coming back. Yeah. To balance. Let me And let me say here, by the way, I am a federal hurricane meteorologist, but I'm here on my own time. Uh, I do the Things I say don't necessarily represent those of my employer, uh, although most of the scientific statements I say are things that come from my job. But I have to say that because I'm doing Heartland stuff on my own time. But it's very important that people notice because this is not all about the climate. The, the point is the focus on man-made climate change, man-made climate change, man-made climate change can obfuscate the real hazard of hurricanes. And what we who put together the NOAA season outlook say again and again it doesn't matter how busy we say a year is going to be, how slow we say a year is going to be. Uh, everybody has to still be ready every year. We got hit by Andrew in a very slow year in 1992. And last year, even though it was, it was, by the way, near normal, it was a near average year overall. Uh, even though it was only a near average year, the devastation by, uh, especially by Eon, was horrendous. Uh, it caused tremendous, tremendous damage. That had no nothing to do with the overall activity of the season. And I'll just say right now, just focusing on the Atlantic, yes, it was the slowest year since about 2000, I believe it's 14. Uh, so we had had a bunch of average years, above average years. Those of us who make the outlook had nothing whatsoever in there about man-made climate change. I keep saying man-made. I don't like just saying climate change. Because I believe in climate yeah, change. Well, Climate's always when's changing. the last time man has produced a hurricane? Name one right, instance right. when man made a hurricane. We Probably in some movie, uh, some Marvel movie, I'm sure they have. Yeah, but, yeah. Uh, the, the, but, the, but the issue is that none of us on the Outlook team, you will not see a single word in our Outlook this year or last year that attributes anything to that. The fact that, like you said, people in the media take it and hype it. If you look at right. the press conference we just had yesterday, 
you'll notice that the media keep asking, well, what about climate change? What about climate change? Yeah, we'll, about- we'll get to that in a second. We'll get but to first, that. I want but- to talk about what happened last year. And you remember the famous Don Lemon incident, right? Um, oh, goodness. <laughs> and this, this was just pathetic. Um, we've got this clip from Don Lemon uh, where he's basically taking the, the NOAA prediction from last year and turning it into his own interpretation of the science, his own interpretation of the forecast meteorology. Don Lemon becomes the hurricane expert. And um, I don't know why, but he did. So do we have that? There it is. Let's, uh, yeah, this was on CNN. And um, Phenomenal this- that, that is happening now because it seems these storms are intensifying. That's the question. I don't think you can link climate change to any one event. Okay. On the whole, on the cumulative, uh, climate change uh, may be making storms worse, uh, but uh, to link it to any one event, um, I I would caution against that. Okay. Well, listen, I grew up there, and these storms are intensifying. (laughs) Something is causing them to (laughs) intensify. If, if, yeah, It is so hard for me to watch that, Anthony, without laughing. Uh, And, uh, and, but by the way, he wasn't leaking even the whole season. He was leaking one particular storm. Uh, and that's the problem, too. We've had horrible, horrendous storms as long as the historical records go back without the help of man doing anything. Or Don Lemon. <laughs> or Don. Uh, yeah, well, yeah, now he's not around to help uh, make these storms worse. But it's it's <laughs> I saw that that comment. Uh, but anyway, um, it, yeah, people have to realize the focus Sciences, hurricanes happen. Get ready, be ready. And regardless what any outlook says, you have to be ready uh, for all these things. By the way, let me just mention 2022. 2022, are all the signals, and this was not climate change, man-made climate change stuff, all the normal climate signals were pointing to an active year tremendously. And what happened is that year actually had a lot of activity before August. What drove the overall activity down is August, which is part of the peak three months, just shut down very unexpectedly. And we looked at that. In fact, we just saw a talk just a couple of weeks ago from a scientist at the University of Illinois that actually had a key as to why it might have shut down. If you know what the TUD is, the tropical upper tropospheric trough, just really dug in. There was all this dry air that poured in. The rest of the season acted like an above average year, but without August, the overall just came to near normal. And sadly, though, the rest of the season did have some devastating storms. So, uh, but we we know that. That's why we have wide air bars on our outlook. We're, we're honest with our uncertainty. If only the uh, man made climate change people would put such wide air bars on their, on their forecast. Well, Stan, is there any way, I mean, with, with technology the way it is now, to predict when a season is just going to shut down the way it did in August? Well, let me say, when this person uh, who was a guest speaker where I work uh, started to give her talk, I immediately emailed the head of our Outlook team. I said, you might be interested in this. And he got on right away. We were so interested. We met with her for two and a half hours the next day because failures in science, the biggest failures often lead to the biggest discoveries. So That's when true. You, Serendipity. Yeah, absolutely. When you realize why did this go wrong, you look into it. And we're really going to look and see if what she talked about, the tut, is predictable uh, on a seasonal scale. Can we look in May or June and say this is going to happen? The problem with some of these things is there's what's called intra-seasonal fluctuations. So in other words, varying from month to month. And sometimes you don't know exactly when those are going to happen. And if they fall right on a peak month like August, you've caused a real, real problem. And uh, so we've we've seen that other years, very busy years. And all of a sudden, a few weeks, that's also Anthony's familiar with the Matt and Julian oscillation, which is like a 40, 60 day oscillation. So that might all of a sudden suppress the activity for a few weeks right near the peak. Uh, so whether the season makes up or not. And those, like we say in our outlook, to predict those back in May or even August is very, very difficult. 
And, uh, you know, the good, the good news is getting back to uh, hurricane realism, uh, it's just like climate realism, is that the advances we have made in prediction, not just the season, but in the track intensity forecast are just amazing. And I actually did a little slide, couple slides showing since Andrew, when it was the 30th anniversary of Andrew last year, the incredible number of advancements we had made and how much better the forecasts are. I forget the exact yes. numbers. I believe it's the 120 yes. hour track forecast, literally as good as the 48 hour forecast 30 years ago. That's huge. Right. So we but made advancements. Even though we we're, just... we're much better in the near term with these forecasts. No right, diff- right. Uh, no, no, no a question about that at all. We've gotten much, much better in the near term forecast. The long term forecast, you know, out months like have been trying to be made are still, you know, somewhat of a crapshoot in that there's a lot of other factors involved. You know, and so that's what, part of the reason why last year failed so badly. You know, the, yes, and you learn some things from that. So I want to talk about what's happening this year so far in the media. Uh, a post from the New Scientist basically came up with saying record breaking sea temperatures are set to bring supercharged storms. Yes, indeedy. They're just going to be out there with superchargers racing around the Atlantic, just sucking up all that warm water and roaring onto the coast and destroying everything. That's their prediction. Uh, and, and it just, you know, it's hype. Yes, we've got warmer sea surface temperatures, but. There's a whole bunch of other factors associated with how hurricanes form and stay working. Um, So, you know, it's just hype. And then we've got another one from NBC. NBC put out a story basically saying something very similar, that basically this warm water is going to bring danger. You know, it's going to rack, it's going to ramp up, it's going to supercharge these storms. Warm Gulf water raises a concern in hurricane season as heat waves spreads across the south. But then again, you know, this is just the media. Just like what Don Lemon did. These guys are playing advocacy. They take a few points that they think are relevant, and then they run with it. And then the, the people that don't know anything about science, don't know anything about meteorology, basically gobble this up as if it's fact. It's, but it's not. It's speculation. Stanley, what do you think? Well, do you know what's so interesting about what you're presenting is if you read our detailed outlook, you'll see that what we talk about is, gee, the waters are super warm in the Atlantic. That tends to be a more uh, active season. We're not talking about man-made stuff. We're just talking about fluctuations. But the waters are also warm in the Pacific, the East Pacific, meaning an El Nino is starting. El Nino tends to suppress activity in the Atlantic. So you have these competing climate factors. That's what our forecast is all about, is these competing climate factors. Because as uh, anybody who studies this stuff knows... I I, I want to interrupt you there, Stanley. I I want to interrupt you because you say climate factors. Now, I want to point out that climate is (laughs) an average over 30 years. Now, when you're saying climate factors, you're thinking seasonal, right? We're, th- we're talking about diff. Oh, what was that? The <laughs> how how the current uh, measures differ from the climate background. So it's still we talk about climate factors. So we okay. can talk about like, right. like a three month average. How do those temperatures? We look at anomalies. So the anomalies are the differences from the climate mean. And uh, but but. It's interesting because the issue is no matter how warm the temperatures are under the storm, it has to have favorable atmospheric conditions. So right. El Nino, how does El Nino affect things in the Atlantic? Is it drives stronger westerlies, winds from the west over the Atlantic, which increases the vertical shear, which inhibits the storms from forming. So we have this could totally ever run. If it becomes a strong El Nino, it's going to smash the hurricane season. That's why our forecast is so iffy this year. Cool. Now, you were involved in producing the forecast for this coming hurricane season in the Atlantic, and that forecast uh, was released this week. 
And, you know, despite the hype that went on with NBC and new scientists saying warmer waters are going to supercharge hurricanes, NOAA predicts a near normal 2023 Atlantic hurricane season. So what's up with that? Well, at some point, uh, are you able to bring up my slides or I'll... Yeah, well, we'll get to that in a second, okay, but let's okay. just talk well, about it now. What's up with that is that we're, there's other factors. It's not just the warm waters. And the warm waters are going to help a few storms. You know, certain ones become hurricanes. A few of them might become major hurricanes. So they'll intensify. We could even have a Cat 5. We could have devastating landfalls. But overall the activity ex is expected to be near normal, though we put a lot of wiggle room. There's so much un uncertainty this year, and we admit it. Yeah, We're so, honest so scientists. <laughs> near normal, uh, according to NOAA, 12 to 17 named storms uh, for this coming season, five to nine hurricanes, and one to four major hurricanes, category three or higher, uh, on the Saffir-Simpson hurricane wind scale. Uh, forecasters say they have 70% confidence in these rangers, you uh, you agree with that? Seventy percent confidence in this prediction? That's exactly how we do it. We we try and be statistical with it, and we say seventy percent of the years where we have these kind of climate factors out there, uh, they um, uh, you know have about this kind of range of activity. Cool. So, what do you think is the biggest reason overall that we're seeing a near normal season despite these elevated sea surface temperatures? Uh, it's just what I said before. First of all, the Atlantic is currently in what we call the high activity era. That's from a paper I wrote back in 2001, where you have a few decades of heightened activity, a few decades of lower activity, not more intense storms, but more of the intense storms. So we're in one of those high activity eras, and that's what's associated with those warmer sea surface temperatures and various other factors in the Atlantic. But you have other climate factors, like someone posted a comment, so many things to consider that is exactly correct. So you have specifically this El Nino event developing. What we don't know, and you talked about predicting things over several months, is there's still no reliable way, no reliable way to accurately predict what's going to happen with ENSO, El Nino or La Nina, uh, even several months in advance. So it looks pretty certain we're going to have an El Nino, how strong it will be. We really don't know. Yeah, that's the 2001 paper there uh, from Science. Someone, someone's at the front, at the front door. door. <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> Tell them I, hi, Anthony. Yeah. Anyway, uh, but you know, so we've got this near normal prediction that came out, you know, the official near normal prediction for hurricane season in the Atlantic for 2023. Yet despite that, yesterday... There was a press conference about all of this. And wouldn't you know it, climate alarmism snuck into that again. Even though they're talking about normalcy, they had to go drive some points home about climate change. And let's just listen to this because it's it's really discouraging, this video clip uh, of what went on in this video, con in this, this video conference with NOAA yesterday. Uh, the 2023 Atlantic hurricane season is quickly going to be upon us, but we are already in the Pacific hurricane season right now. And as we are seeing the impacts of Super Typhoon Mawar, what we are seeing is that these types of events are increasing and intensifying more rapidly, um, which is what we saw over the last few days. But it That's we also uh, continue our work to help communities build resilience to disasters. Uh, we're seeing uh, more and more impacts from these uh, hurricanes, and so we have to get ahead of that. And we have to make communities more resilient and reduce the impacts that we're seeing. These storms are going to continue to develop faster. They are going to be stronger. They will last longer. FEMA will be ready to support you. If one hits you, are you going to be ready? The risks of these storms are different than the risks that they faced 10 years ago. We have to be able to get that message out to people. Right. Okay. So apparently the head of FEMA doesn't look at the actual data related to hurricanes because, you know, she's saying they're going to get worse. They're going to develop faster. They're going to be stronger. They're going to last longer. And it's going to be worse than 10 years ago. Well, if you bring up real-world data instead of model forecast projections or belief systems, it looks entirely different. This is global 
tropical cyclone frequency from scientist Dr. Ryan Maui. He's been running this for several years. His thesis was based on this. So here we have the number of tropical storms globally since 1970. Does anyone see an upward trend pattern in that? In fact, that little peak over on the um, on the right hand side in 19 in 2021 is actually lower than the peak back in 1971. So, where's the climate crisis? It isn't there, Stanley. Well, let me say this. Thankfully, most of the other speakers of that press conference, and people can access that at NOAA.gov, there's a link for the press conference, uh, focused on the reality of what's going on. Uh, I don't know where she got her information. Thankfully, I'm going to say kudos to her. Her preparedness information was good. Uh, her FEMA information was good, but she stepped out of her uh, expertise and started to uh, you know, predict the climate change stuff. Uh, she not only said, she said, it's worse now than it was 10 years ago. And in 10 years ago, it's going to be even worse. And they're intensifying faster. We see no evidence for that. It's uh, They're lasting longer. We see no evidence for that. Uh, if you understand the database, one of the most difficult things people have when they do studies is they have to properly use historical database. We have someone on this forum right now, initials AW, who makes uh, a tremendous effort to show how there's problems with the database for temperatures by looking yeah. at the different stations and looking how accurate they are. Well, when we look at hurricane data, we've got to know how that data comes. I personally have flown uh, on numerous, numerous hurricane flights into the storms, help collect the data, help process the data. I know all sorts of nuances that other people don't know and know how the data collection and the quality of the data has changed from year to year and decade to decade. I'll give you right. one example, by the way, and Hurricane Andrew, when it hit, we thought it was category four, 931 millibars. Short while after we realized it was 922 millibars. Then 10 years later, they upped it to a cat five, not because they found new data, they found a more accurate way to interpret the data they had then. And some of the hurricanes in the historical record when they've done a reanalysis, they lower the strength. Those are done by Dr. Chris Lancey, who's at the Hurricane Center, uh, because there's all sorts of things we know now we didn't know then, and we re-examine the data. So people got to know with the historical database. When I've got so many slides that show, you know, you can say, oh, the number of storms and hurricanes have doubled in the last hundred years or so. Well, we didn't have satellite, we didn't have reconnaissance, even the satellite. From when I started in this business in 1980 to the satellite data we have now is like looking through a blurry telescope versus, you know, the Hubble or something like that. I mean, it's totally different. And anybody who's been around in the field knows that. So right. that's where they keep making the mistake again and again. So, you know, we looked at a couple of graphics just before looking at global tropical hurricane frequency as well as major storms. Major storms is actually going down. Major hurricanes actually has declined in the last 40 years or so. Um, but interestingly enough, despite the fact that the head of FEMA is out there touting getting worse, getting stronger, it's going to be worse in 10 years, blah, blah, blah. Science says otherwise. Here's a nature paper that talked about declining tropical cyclone frequency under global warming. Well, gosh, how can that be? Global warming is making hurricane frequency decline? Oh, no, it's anti-narrative. What will we do? That's science. Science doesn't give a rat's ass about the narrative. Well, and it's interesting. Noah has been very clear about how uh, El Nino is going to dampen the, uh, you know, severity of or it could potentially dampen the severity of some of the hurricane season this year. But I've seen in the media over and over again in the last week, they've been screaming about El Nino making it hotter and making hurricanes more dangerous because it adds energy to the system is what they're. So the people who are reporting on this stuff do no research whatsoever. They see El Nino means that it's a warmer cycle. And to them, warming equals more extreme storms. And that's right. the end of their curiosity on the subject. Well, let me comment on that right away. Number one, El Nino, because it warms the East Pacific, does make the East Pacific season 
stronger, uh, more active. And that was our forecast we made for the East Pacific. But the Atlantic, it is absolutely the opposite. Uh, because the East Pacific waters don't warm the Atlantic waters, uh, and right. it increases the vertical shear. Uh, and yeah, they oh no, 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 it does it by <laughs> teleconnection. That's our other favorite right. thing, you know. Right. Well, but it does. It's it's by teleconnection that it increases the vertical shear. Doesn't change the temperature of the ocean by teleconnection, but just increases the vertical yeah. shear. And and this is this is the thing. Whether the season is busy, and I have to be, uh, you know, the crier of doom here, whether the season is going to be a busy one or a slow one, whether anthropogenic climate change is making it worse or not, hurricanes are devastating if it hits your area. And I urge everybody, if you're in a hurricane prone area, to look at your preparedness, get ready early, do the stuff now so you don't have to rush out to the hardware store, you know, three days before the storm trying to fix stuff up. Now's the time um. to prepare course of least regret and be ready. Because let me tell you something that has, again, nothing to do with this climate change stuff, is that all of the Category 5 storms that have hit the U.S., there's been four of them recorded uh, in the last 50, wait, 90 years. All of them were tropical storms less than 60 hours before landfall. Uh, mm. So these horrible, devastating storms revved up right before they hit land. And believe me, the Hurricane Center, with all their wonderful tools they have, can predict that, oh, this is going to rapidly intensify. But to say how much, to these extreme things, as as yeah. meteorologists know, are the hardest thing to predict. So people really have to hope for the best, prepare for the worst. I'm grateful yes. that the forecasts for Eon were extremely good. People say, yeah, but it was saying it was going further up the coast. No, those areas were in the cone. They were still warned uh, and people had to be ready for it. We talked about that last yeah, year. Preparedness is important. Absolutely. That's the key to surviving any kind of tropical storm or hurricane. And also, of course, knowing your evacuation routes and being ready to go. My advice is stock up on all that free Bud Light out there and beef jerky. <laughs> You're all set. <laughs> anyway. We've got a presentation. Should have warned Stan. me on that. Should have warned me on that one. <laughs> <laughs> Stan has a presentation he's prepared. So let's go to that and Stan, take it away. <laughs> okay. For those who have tuned in, I want to do a quick run through of the actual outlook, not media hyped. And you can see the press release. Uh, you can go back to these slides and see where you can find the press release and the detailed outlook. This is like several pages long, talks about all the science, et cetera. And this is run by uh, Matthew Rosencrantz up at the uh, Center for Predict uh, Climate Prediction Center. Uh, and I'm one of the team on that. So let's go to the next slide. This is what the outlook looks like for 2023. So basically 40% chance of near normal and 30 each for above and below. That's a really wishy-washy outlook. I'll admit it. That's almost like 33, 33, 33. And what we're saying is it leans heavier towards the near normal. But if the El Nino doesn't get strong, then the Atlantic conditions could take over. If the El Nino gets strong, it could shove it down. So we're, we're going to update this in August. And there's the range of storms, and we can see as many as four major hurricanes. The so next slide. I want to go through these quick. Next slide. Yeah, there we go. Just to look at the 2022, back in May and in August, we were saying this really looks like it's going to be an active season. And as we talked about before, though, this strange stuff happened in August, just shut it down. Uh, go to the next slide. And I don't know if people can see this. Maybe you can make it bigger. Uh, is that the um, if you look at the 2022, that middle column, uh, it was it came out to be a near normal year, uh, which we still said 35 percent chance. And the numbers were very close. We've had bombs before. Uh, this was not a bomb. And uh, and there's the 2023 uh, by contrast. So next next slide. And just to put it in the historical perspective. So back before 19. 71, we were in a very high activity year. Remember I said this changes on a multi-decadal scale. So it actually went back to 1926. You had a lot of above average years and some of these what we call hyperactive years. Uh, and then you had this low period from 71 
1994, hardly any, even above average years. That was the amazing thing. That's when I started working where I work. And there were so few storms in the Atlantic, we often had enough flight hours. We would go out to the East Pacific at the end of the year and fly those. Uh, it was just for 20, 24 years uh, overall below normal. We still had bad storms, Hugo and Andrew, but overall it was below. Then we switched back in 1995 to this high activity era, um, all due to man-made climate change. No, no. Uh, <laughs> this You can see the cycle clearly. And that shows the May 23 outlook in perspective. So you had like six years in a row that were above average. And then 2022 came along near normal. And this year might be another near normal. Next slide. Oh, wait, go back to that slide. I'll say one thing very clearly here is the problem is a lot of people start their studies in the 70s and go up through the present. So they start in a low time, come up to the high time. They have reasons for that. They want to have satellite data. They want to have better data with this. But if they ignore that previous active era, they get a trend rather than a cycle. That's the biggest mistake these studies make. This uh, could, stand real right. quick, this could actually explain also like what people like Don Lemon will say. And I, I, I do notice that the ages of the people who tend to make those comments that hurricanes are getting worse and worse all the time, they tend to be people who were probably like teenagers in that 70s, 80s range. Right. Um, so maybe that that could be just an observational thing that they're not really thinking about. It's the burned out hippie syndrome. That's right. What it is. Let, let me tell you a little anecdote. One of my favorite musicals is West Side Story, the original version. Uh, West Side Story, and uh, and there's a there's a line in there in the song America. It talks about Puerto Rico, and it says, "Always the hurricanes blowing," and that was written in the fifties during the high activity era. And I guarantee you, in the seventies and eighties, there were very few hurricanes in Puerto Rico, so it was written during a high activity era. And by the way. People who look at this and say, wait a minute, wait a minute, the current active era looks busier than the previous active era. You know, man-made climate change. I say there was no satellite for most of that previous active era. Uh, recon was in its infancy stages. We were not measuring a lot of these things. So um, uh, anyway, let's go uh, to the next slide now. Okay, this is just giving a picture of some of what we're looking at. This is what the current, I'm sorry, these are the predicted uh, sea surface temperatures for August, September, October. So in the Pacific, where you see it's really warm, these are two different models, really warm, that band of red, that's where we expect the El Nino. Uh, and then in the Atlantic, where you see MDR, that little box, that's above average also there. Uh, so there's two competing signals there. Again, these are forecasts. These are climate forecasts. And I guarantee you there's not a lot of skill, but this gives a general picture of what could happen. So next slide. Right, right. Before you leave that go slide, ahead. Go ahead. before let's go back to that slide for just a second. I want to say something about El Nino. El Nino is a natural phenomena that has occurred for millennia. It's part of our normal uh, weather systems and, and ocean circulation systems and so forth. We were only recently made aware of it starting in the early 1990s, I believe, um, and maybe a little earlier than that. But point is, is that this is a natural phenomenon. And it's also something that is a safety valve for the planet. You know, when the ocean starts venting heat, like you see here, uh, making the surface waters warmer, that heat goes up to space as part of the infrared radiation into the upper atmosphere. It is a safety valve for the planet. It's a governor for the planet's temperature. So. El Nino is not a, how should I say it, a, a result of climate change. It's a safety valve. Stan, do you agree with that? Absolutely. It's part of the natural climate fluctuations. And in fact, later, slide number 18, uh, if you remind me, that is such an insightful slide on what happens with global sea surface temperatures. I didn't do that study. I wish I did. But someone mm. else in our lab did, and it really shows it. But these are this is normal kind of stuff. Nobody looks at this and says, "Oh no, climate again." I hate saying just climate change, man-made climate change. Uh, this is normal climate fluctuations. By the way, you said something very interesting. You said before the '90s, people didn't know about El Nino. But when I got my master's degree at Florida State under Dr. James J. O'Brien. 
he was one of the, he was almost Mr. El Nino. And he was studying that stuff way back in the 70s. There were other things because what really brought attention to El Nino, there was a massive El Nino, 72, 73. Right. And really the, the media stuff. really didn't make anything out of it. It wasn't aware to the general public until it right. like in. I know. 90s. That's what I'm saying. Now it's a common household word. But when I was in school, nobody knew what this stuff was. El Nino, La Nina, right. et cetera. By the way, he wanted to call La Nina El Viejo. Uh, so it's the little child and the old man. Uh, mm. But he didn't win. He didn't win with that. Do you know why it's called El Nino, the child? It's the, the boy, the Christ child. A basically. Absolutely. They that because it had a tendency to start forming in December near Christmas, um, and the people that live on the Pacific and little towns like Zawatneo and so forth started coining this phrase: "The boy is coming," uh, to say El Nino is coming as well. Absolutely, it peaks in around that time. It doesn't really start then, but it peaks then. Now you all know who are watching the rest of the story, why it's called El Nino. And then just someone came up with La Nina just to do a copy. Just to balance it out. Yeah, good right, to go to the next know. slide here. Okay. Next slide, yeah, wherever we were. Look at his next slide. There we go. Somewhere. Okay. The reason I want to show this is because you're going to keep hearing the phrase whenever you deal with hurricanes and climate, you're going to keep hearing main development region. And that actually came, believe it or not, from one of my papers back in 1996. Most people don't even know where it came from and don't reference me. But uh, that came from a paper. And what it showed, that figure shows that most of these waves, most of these systems coming off of Africa that become major hurricanes start developing in this band between Africa and Central America. The vast majority of them. So what happens in that little strip there as far as the sea surface temperatures and the vertical shear and, and different kind of things, the humidity really affects the whole hurricane season. Uh, so that's why we keep focusing on the main development region. So let's go to the next slide. Okay, so this is a summary of all the climate factors uh, and uh, that are expected. I forgot to enlarge that yellow, yellow box, which is the main development region. MDR, but we expect warmer ocean, and that's both in the North and the tropical Atlantic. We expect uh, weaker easterly trades. That means the vertical shear is going to be lower, but then you have the El Nino, which is going to make it near average vertical shear. Uh, you have the African monsoon. You have all these different factors, like someone posted a note. There's a lot of things to consider, and that's exactly correct. So we have this high activity area, but El Nino is competing. So let's go to the next slide and we're almost done here. I just wanted to show this. I expect you to, I'm going to test you all on this slide, but this is some of the stuff that goes into our outlook. Uh, we have regression analysis we do with the Climate Prediction Center. We have uh, all sorts of other statistical analysis. Then there's models. So there's actually models that directly predict how many storms will be there. All sorts of algorithms they do with that, and they're getting better and better. Uh, not that I trust them in, <laughs> explicitly, but they are getting better and better. And then there's um, the even... Uh, the, the you know, I don't see the swag <laughs> model represented there. <laughs> well, the nice thing with this, we basically take a straight average of all these, and we look at it. Just like the Hurricane Center, when they make a forecast for a particular storm, they look at all the different guidance, but then they add their own intuitive sense to it and experience. We That's do good. the same thing with this. We look at this, we look at the average, and we say, however, because this model does this and this model, so we adjust with all those things. So let's go to uh, the next slide. And just to wrap it up for the public, and, and I'm done with my presentation of 2023 Outlook, is that what's the value of this thing? I once did a talk years ago in the Caribbean. All the meteorologists down there were gathered together. It's like, we want to understand these, these climate forecasts uh, for the hurricane season. I said, well, the problem is for the public, it doesn't matter what the forecast is. You've got to be ready every year. But issuing this like we did yesterday kind of gets people's attention and you can talk about hurricane awareness, but for NOAA, for emergency managers, for our people flying the planes, it kind of helps to evaluate your resources. If you say this is going to be a really busy year, you might say it's not a you know total fact. You don't know for sure who's going to be hit and how, 
but you say we probably need to save up just like you think there's going to be a snowstorm maybe it won't pan out but you want to get ready for it and that's what this can be good for so anyway let's uh any discussion you want to do and uh well that was a great uh, presentation there stan a lot of good information of course we're going to go to question and answer from our um uh, our viewers, um, you can also use the super chat feature like this one here from Christine Laurel. She says, keep on speaking the truth. The world needs to hear it. Uh, it wasn't actually a question, but it's just a little bit of uh, go get them, I guess, just say. And uh, thank you, thank Christine, you Christine, for doing that. Yeah, thank we appreciate you. that. By the way, let me do one more thing. Just show my very next slide. The very next one. After that, there we go. Because this is the talk that I gave at the wonderful Heartland Conference. Anybody listening, any way you can to get to one of these Heartland Climate Conferences, just do it. They are fantastic in so many levels. Uh, and then you get to see people like Anthony and myself, everybody else speak. But but I, I said, it. why does it seem like hurricanes are getting stronger and more destructive? And that's the issue. It's this media thing. It's some of the bioscience. But you can watch that slide. You'll see the link on the top just bit.ly slash Goldenberg Orlando and watch the whole slide. And actually, when you get there, you can watch lots of other talks from that conference as well. So I just want people to, to see that. And, and in fact, let me, let me just throw in two more real quick and then get to the questions, 23 and 24, 23 and 24. Yeah, well, um, we'll get to those slides here. There we go. They're moving through it. 23 and 24. Okay, there There's you go. 23. This is this is just so important. Anthony, I know you're very familiar with stuff by Pilkey and Lancey. The issue that when they say, hey, they're getting more devastating, it's the issue that if you adjust things, these figures showing how much you know the damage was year by year, adjusted for inflation, okay, then you say, wow, it's getting worse and worse. But then you go to the next slide. Next one. There we go. There we go. And you adjust it for population and value of property in harm's way. And there's no trend whatsoever. Back right. To Basically, okay. what's happened there is that, you know, we starting in the 1980s, you know, America started getting very, very prosperous and moving to the coast, getting a second summer home or a rental or being whatever all became very popular to have these summer rentals on the coast and so there was a lot of building along coastlines that started in 1980 and so with more building more people you're going to get more damages as plain as day but when you adjust it for inflation and population values boom it's not really anything big deal at all okay so we're going to go and talk to um talk about some of our questions that have been brought up by our viewers <laughs> and um uh, so you, you know what i'm laughing at right <laughs> yeah yeah well hey yeah. i had to put it somewhere i also <laughs> i also know that i also know a a candy weatherford who's a hurricane uh a, a, a uh, right. meteorologist. Well. I happen to think Rick Spinrad, you know, you know, radar spinning, uh, is being with the weather service, that's pretty darn good too. He's a great guy. He's a great guy. Yeah. Okay. So let's look at some of our real questions from some of our viewers and see what they have to say. Isn't it unusual for an El Nino to follow a La Nina winter? I don't know. What do you think, Stan? Oh, not at all. Not at all. They switch towards the summer and uh, you can switch from a like 72, I don't have a chart in front of me, but uh, 72, 73 was a horrendous El Nino. And then it's flip-flop to a very, very strong La Nina. Uh, the same hmm. thing happened in 97. 97 uh, was one of the strongest on record. It shut down the hurricane season tremendously. You talk about the peak, August, September, October had only, I think, one hurricane. I mean, it was really, really slow. Uh, because that strong El Nino, and then it hit the summer of 98, and it flipped to a very strong La Nina, and that's when we made our first seasonal outlook, who said, this means it's going to be a busy year, La Nina plus the high activity area. So not unusual at all. Hmm. Yeah, I'm, I'm surprised. Um, but, you know, nature does things on her own. She doesn't give a hoot about what we think. All right, next question. Linnea, for you. How much does solar min and max influence ocean temperature? I'm not sure that I could say that. <laughs> I'm not sure that I could uh, speak very intelligently on that. I do know that the 
influence of solar activity on any kind of climate related topic is still very much up for debate. It's still a lot of research going into it. I'm sure that probably, I mean, it makes sense that if you were to have a super active solar year, that earth temperatures would probably be higher. But I don't know, because I saw some conversations going on in the chat that were talking about um, solar impact on like tectonic type activity. And I'm I'm not sure. I don't know very much about that. It, it kind of, I know that there are some good researchers who are, um, you know, making claims. Uh, I, I couldn't, I couldn't judge uh, how accurate they are. I can comment on it. Um, one of the things that I think is an even bigger factor than solar activity, and it may be related to solar activity in some way, is the amount of cloud cover. Now, the amount of cloud cover is a huge regulator for how much solar radiation impacts the surface, particularly at the intertropical convergence zone, which is around the equator. It's that band of clouds that develops uh, every day. It builds up, reflects sunlight, thunderstorms, vent the heat to the upper atmosphere, produce rain, and that process repeats time and time again on a daily basis. The IPCZ is a regulator for equatorial temperature, particularly in the Pacific. And so as a result, change in cloud cover in the ITCZ related to, you know, perhaps solar influence, perhaps the number of condensation nuclei available and so forth and so on, is a big factor in controlling just how much heat might be in the uh, tropical areas where hurricanes form. Uh, and let me just make one other comment with that. Uh, Anthony, there's so many different signals. And when you do one of these studies, you have to know how to distinguish cause and effect, you know, what's really causing it just because it's fluctuating the same doesn't mean it's causing it. And also resolve the different signals. And I'm certainly not an expert with that, but we've had a, a solar guy expert at the ICCCs, uh, but he's not on the call this time. Okay. All right. So let's see the next question here. Uh, the solar earthquake thing, we're not going to address that. Okay. It'd be nice if more news articles made it clear to readers that the climate models are just simulations. <laughs> oh, gosh, yes, you're right. It would be nice, but is it going to happen? No. Yeah, I want to point out. Yes, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> you know, here's something that most people don't realize, and I just did a story on this on climate realism this week. Uh, it's up on, on climate realism today, as a matter of fact, climaterealism.com. The Associated Press, the largest press entity in the world, the most influential press entity in the world, got an $8 million grant last year to push more climate change narratives. And, you know, they're basically out there saying death and destruction from the skies is coming your way. Stay tuned. You know, we're going to hit this tipping point of 1.5 degrees centigrade because of the El Nino. Well, it's rubbish absolute rubbish. And I want to point out that, you know, when you've got an $8 million grant for people telling you to write climate change related stories, and we got people like Seth Borenstein, who's a dyed in the wall climate alarmist, who doesn't look at anything except what comes out that's hypable, you end up with these kinds of stories, basically saying that we're going to have, you know, that we're going to go off the rails, you know, the 1.5 degree centigrade tipping point is going to be reached, then the world's going to be coming more dangerous due to climate change and more hurricanes and blah, blah, blah. Bottom line is we've already gone through this. If you look at the European temperature uh, over the last uh, 150 years or so, here it is. We've already gone through in Europe, and Europe is one of the oldest records, and that's why I use this, two degrees centigrade of warming on the, uh, in Europe, and Europe is still there. Where's the climate kind of, crisis? Kind of. <laughs> <laughs> well, it depends if you're asking socially or uh, <laughs> condition. <laughs> yeah, but the media is not ever going to report things accurately. They're, they are paid to produce the narrative, and the AP is in the pocket of people that are feeding them money to produce disaster stories. Let, let me make a couple quick comments on it. Is Number one, as far as the climate models, I give a 
my favorite quote from Joanne Simpson, who was a top, top meteorologist. I believe she yeah, was the first She female. was great. I, I oh, met yeah. her once. Oh, she's, she's quite a character, too. But she um, uh, was the first female to get a Ph.D., uh, University of Chicago in meteorology, uh, and brilliant, brilliant uh, scientist. Uh, but the thing is, she said this when she retired. She said, now that I'm retired, I can speak my mind. And she said, as far as all this global warming stuff, she said, you know, most of it's based on the climate models. And we all know how bad the models are. And yes. it's not that they're worthless. It's that you have to take them with a lot of grains of salt, probably a pound or two, and be aware of what their limitations are. And by the way, I want you to know that it, when if people watch my Orlando talk, I did a bunch of M's. And one of the M's I forgot, I got to add to that talk, was money, which you just mentioned. Why do we see so many articles? Why do we see so many things? Because there's tons of grant money out there for people who will try and show, uh, you know, that uh, man-made climate change is going to make things worse and worse. Lots and lots of money uh, being poured into that. But climate models, right? We we I I really have to say this little anecdote quickly as I was in a a, a talk one time. And the, the forum was, how can we communicate the uncertainty without losing the message? And that meant, <laughs> how do we tell them we really don't know what's going to happen, but we don't want to change our message? And at one point, they said, now that we can predict, uh, El, no, no, now, the, now that the, uh, oh, now that we can predict El Nino so well, you know, now that the climate models are so good, we predict, and I burst out laughing in the back of the room. And they all looked at me and I said, you've got to be kidding. I'm sitting here working on our notice season outlook. And our main source, our main problem is to El Nino or not to El Nino. And, and I said, there's still oh. no reliable way to accurately predict it several months in advance. Don't tell me that the El Nino you know, models are so good and that you can predict models you know, 20, 50, and you know, 100 years in advance. So. Go ahead. Take it away. Next question. Yeah, you know, so we've got this question here from John Z. He's talking about the Farmer's Almanac, uh, saying, use sunspots to make predictions on weather. Are there any meteorological scientists using sunspots and that Earth's magnetic field concerning jet streams? Well, you know, we had early in the, um, when, when WWT was first put into place in 2006, we started looking at sunspots on a regular basis and trying to link in correlations with weather activity and so forth and so on. And at this point, I am of the of the belief, based on what I've seen published, especially by Willis Eckenbot, who's published a lot of stuff on sunspots on what's up with that, basically that we can't see any significant correlation between sunspot activity and climate change at all. Now, there are some weather events that can be spurred on by uh, immediate changes on the sun, um, but there just doesn't seem to be any long-term linkage to sunspot activity. I know there's people that are out there that publish papers on that and say, yes, it's true. But when you go back and you really analyze the data like Willis has done, you find that some of these claims are just not warranted. So I don't believe there's any link there to sunspot activities. And I certainly would not trust the Farmer's Almanac uh, I remember my good friend Joe D'Aleo from Weatherbell did a study about the Farmer's Almanac and its reliability for predictions, and it really wasn't any better than a coin toss. They just, you know, gin it up in a nice presentation to make you think it's actually useful, but they don't have any super-duper secret formula for forecasting that seems to be any better than a coin toss when you actually look at the statistics. All right, next question. What do we got? Doug Pollock, is there any forecast for El Nino Peak this year? Ah, I don't have my El Nino forecast in front of me, but uh, you can actually go to Climate Prediction Set. We're, see, because we don't look at the peak, it normally peaks around December, January. For the hurricane outlook, we look at what it's going to be in August, September, October for the peak of the hurricane season. So I can say it's probably going to peak you know, towards the end of the year, and that'll be global effects. You know, we're looking at just the, see, El Nino, because of this big area of warm water, what it does is it increases the convection, increases the thunderstorms, increases rising motion, that gets up, and those rising motions spread out and affect things all over the world. Just a little nudge in certain directions. And with the Atlantic, you don't have to nudge it much into higher vertical shear 
to shut down a lot of the hurricane activity. Uh, so I won't predict exactly what that peak is. I don't even know what the peak, how much it will peak out in August, September, October. As fun All as right. our area is, you know, the play between the Pacific and the Atlantic and the Gulf and stuff um, in North America and Central America, it's fun too when you start looking at like the uh, Indian monsoon season and its relationship to El Nino in the Pacific. And you look at what's it going to do for Australia? What's it going to do for India? What's it going to oh, do yeah. for East Africa? It's there's so many factors. It's incredible when you try to start kind of parsing it out. And, um, it can get confusing because there's so many different um, psych like cyclical systems that counterbalance each other. Yeah, there's uh, a lot so of interdependency. <laughs> yeah, right. so it's hard it's hard to lay blame at any uh, individual system's feet. Now, let me give the rest of the story on this because I was part of a study that focused on this Nino 3.4 region. And what people have to realize there's some what we call canonical El Ninos and non-canonical or fit and not fit. So you can have an El Nino event in the Pacific, but the teleconnections, the things that change things all over the world, don't really kick in. And so you have those. When you have those, there's just no correlation with Atlantic hurricane activity. It doesn't matter. You can have a busy year even with El Nino. But then you have it where it you know, hits critical mass, so to speak, and you have all these global teleconnections. Right. Okay. So do we have any other questions uh, that we want to put up here? All right. Why, if there is a relationship between solar activity and hurricanes, are there no hurricanes? <laughs> well, there are hurricanes in the Southern Hemisphere. Stanley, you got this one. Right. The, the issue is there's there's Southern Indian Ocean. There's the Southern uh, West Pacific. The place that there's rarely anything is uh, in the Southern Atlantic. So I almost think we had yep. something a few years ago. Occasionally something pops up there. One of the things is you don't have this large band of warm water. You don't have the easterly waves coming across. You, you just have, oh, I like that comment. <laughs> have a second hour. We're having fun here. Uh, um, but, uh, you know, I like people see me laugh a lot. And that's because some of the statements are downright ludicrous that we hear out there. And I'm, that's not political for me. I don't know that anybody is making the statements we are on this on this forum from a political standpoint. I'm looking at the yeah. science. So uh, oh. and and but so that's 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 why it's just there. It, there are bad hurricanes in the uh, southern hemisphere. And uh, and Andy, I'm going to remind you whenever we can slip it in. I want to get that slide 18. It's just very very informative. And we're over already. Okay, let me explain this quickly to everybody. Now, this is the rest of the story. So this is what called empirical orthogonal function analysis. And, and what that is, it's a fancy way of saying they look at all of the, in this case, all of the global sea surface temperatures. And they do some fancy mathematics to find out what are the main modes of variability. Because you have different mechanisms that cause things. So the top picture on the left is shows the basically the global warming mode. In other words, there is a mode of Atlantic sea, of, of, of global sea surface temperature variability that has increased. Now that's not saying it's anthropogenic. There can be all sorts of reasons for that. We did hit that little ice age, and you know that uh, ended around 1850. But one way or another, you have a mode that shows warming. The interesting thing is that mode, when they correlate it with the vertical shear over the Atlantic, is associated with increased vertical shear. So the more that mode warms, the fewer hurricanes you have in the Atlantic. Then you have the second mode, which is the El Nino mode. So therefore, uh, you can see that red tongue coming out of uh, you know South America. That's your El Nino mode. And you can see the, the time series on the right that it goes up and down you know, three to seven years. Well, when that's warmer, you also have increased vertical shear, uh, you know, stifling as much hurricane activity. But the third mode is the Atlantic multidecadal mode. And that's what we use for our paper showing the multidecadal scale fluctuation. So that the Atlantic warms, actually, the, it's a dipole. The north warms, the south cools on the order of several decades. In that particular mode, that's associated with decreased vertical shear. So when that, when the Atlantic warms in that mode, you have more hurricane activity 
in the Atlantic. And it's a very strong change. The difference between the low activity area and high activity area when it's warm or cooler is like twice as much overall activity, two and a half times as many major, major hurricanes. Are you ready for this? Five times as many hurricanes in the Caribbean and 10 times as many October major hurricanes. And that's all from that multi-decadal mode. So they have to realize just because Seifer's temperatures are getting warmer somewhere does not mean it's associated with the mechanism that makes more hurricanes. So thank you for letting me share from that one complex slide, but I think it's extremely interesting uh, for people yes, to understand. It is. it is indeed, and it's complex too. And yes, we're going to do maybe not a full second hour, but we are <laughs> going to extend this this broadcast. Wait, do I get overtime? Bit. Yeah, we're going to go a little bit long here. I want to talk about something Linnea was mentioning earlier when I mentioned uh, the when she mentioned complexity and I mentioned interdependency. One of the biggest things that a lot of folks don't understand about our atmospheric system and long-term climate is how complex and chaotic it is. And I read a book back in 1990 that changed my entire viewpoint on our ability to forecast into the future. It changed my viewpoint on why we were having so much trouble forecasting weather into the future just a few days ahead, as well as long-term prediction. This book, Chaos, The Making of a New Science by James Gleick, who is the sensible older brother of Peter Gleick, who slammed the Heartland Institute about a decade ago by opposing as a board member, grabbing some information and then spewing it over the internet. He's the, the smarter older brother of, the, of that guy, wrote this book. And this book is something everyone should read. And I'm not pushing the book to sell anything. This is just up there on Amazon. Point is, chaos happens. It Complex systems such as the Earth's complex atmosphere, the longer term you go further out, the more chaotic it gets. Things get less predictable as you go down the timeline. And this is the problem with climate models. The climate is incredibly complex. There's all kinds of factors. These folks that insist that carbon dioxide is the only thing that controls the climate are not paying attention to science or reality. They, the, the chaotic nature of the atmosphere, you know, we've got the El Nino venting heat. We've got La Nina cool, cooling things down. We've got changes in um, global ocean circulation that happens. We've got changes in uh, the amount of... Um, uh, particulate matter in the atmosphere. We've got changes in the amount of sulfur dioxide from volcanoes in the atmosphere. All of these things contribute to the chaotic nature of both weather and climate. So prediction on a long term gets harder and harder the more complex it gets. And that's why, you know, 40 years ago when I first started doing uh, television weather, we couldn't really get a, a good prediction any more than about three to five days out. Now, with computer models that have gotten better, more accurate, and we've got supercomputers running these things, we're able to predict seven to 10 days out with some reasonable accuracy. But given that the atmosphere is complex, the climate is complex, how does it get any better on the long term out 100 years? It doesn't. They can't really do it. It's just that simple. I suggest everyone read this book. So we we have some kind of crash there while I was. Oh talking. yeah. Oh, I've got thunderstorms. This is South Florida afternoon thunderstorms. Uh, oh. courtesy of all the hot well, there air. There you go. Generating. Some 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 real world chaos going on right there, right there. All right. Next question from Danny Green. What role does pole shift play in the climate change? Now I we need to qualify that. There's two kinds of pole shifts. Uh, there's magnetic pole shift, and then there's actual physical pole shifts. And we're not ever going to have a pole shift where, you know, the north and south pole go like this. Never going to happen. But we do have wobble associated with the north and south pole precession over about, I believe it's a 23,000 year period. And so with that wobble and that precession, we do get a change in the way the solar radiation irradiates the northern and some southern hemisphere over the seasons. So that affects climate on a long-term basis. Uh, they're called Milankovitch cycles. But on the short term, no, no, no effect there. And a magnetic pole shift, of which there seems to be one going on because the North Pole is wandering all over the place uh, lately, doesn't seem to have any effect based on what I know. Stan, do you have anything to add to that? Linnea, do you have anything to add to that? 
I am not one on the pole shift area that I have no expertise in that area. What's a smart thing for a scientist to say is I don't know anything about that. So, okay. All no, right. I know it's something that's discussed a lot um, in, I don't know, kind of layperson uh, comment sections and stuff. And I, I think that sometimes we tend to, uh, exaggerate <laughs> what it means when we say pole shift. I think most of the time what people are talking or what they're imagining when you say pole shift is like what Anthony said, like an extreme flip. And I've seen it propagated on the internet that the um, 23,000 yeah. year cycle is a total flip of the poles. And I, that doesn't seem to be the case. Right. Well, the great thing about the flat earth theory is that there's no pole flips available on the flat <laughs> earth. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. We needed that, Anthony. All righty. Let's go on to the next question. <laughs> uh, so what do we got? A typhoon. Is a typhoon the same as a hurricane, but in a different region? Yes. Well... <laughs> That's a quick answer. Yeah. Oh, but Listen, wait. What easy. about Willy Willies? Willy, where are Willy Willies, Anthony? Yes. The Willy Willies Australia. are also typhoons and right. hurricanes. You basically, in the Atlantic, East Pacific and Central Pacific, we call them hurricanes. In the West Pacific, we call them typhoons. In the Indian Ocean, we call them cyclones. And uh, we, and then in Australia, they they used to use willy willy, but I think they just call them cyclones. And uh, they're all exactly the same thing. The only difference is in the Northern Hemisphere, they rotate uh, counterclockwise, and in the Southern Hemisphere, they rotate clockwise. And that science article I talked about with the multi-decado scale shift, I had sent them a picture to use for the cover. It became the cover article. And I'm telling you, um, they sent the picture for the cover. And I was all excited with showing it to people in the hallway where I worked. And someone, I was too excited to notice. And Sim Averson, I'll give him credit. He looked at it. He said, they've got it backwards. And what they did is they flipped the picture so it would look like a Southern Hemisphere storm. <laughs> so <laughs> it was Hurricane Mitch. Uh, that's that's just a uh, civil mistake. By the way, let me let me uh, before you maybe, before you go oh, to go this, Dan, I want to point out something Al Gore did about ten years, maybe maybe twelve years ago. He pushed, uh, I believe it was a book, and Dr. Ryan Maui pointed this out. There was a one of those you know glossy covers to this his book and i i forget which of his books it was but some he assigned some climate or rather some graphic artists to this book to make this cover and they had cyclones in the northern hemisphere rotating the wrong direction you know this was how good al gore's science is that you can't even get the rotation of cyclones right in the northern hemisphere Ugh. wait wait i have to tell an al gore story is that when we first started putting out our seasonal outlook in 1998, uh, one of the first years they had Al Gore announce the outlook down here in Fort Lauderdale. I was horrified. I, remember that. I thought he was going to botch it. And you know what? He just did it straight. He got the outlook absolutely right. One of the other years, the head of NOAA did the outlook and he accidentally read Bill Gray's forecast instead of ours. So, oh. so even Al Gore got it better than him. No, I just want to, by the way, it, before the next question, I just want to slip in. Uh, he's got a ready slide 25 uh, because this is important when you deal with the season. It's not because they're going to say this year was more destructive and this year was less destructive. It's not how intense the tropical cyclone hit. By the way, the generic name all over the world is tropical cyclone. So that's anything from depression and above is generic name is tropical cyclone. So uh, it's not how intense the tropical cyclone is. It's where and when. So it depends on the population, the building codes, the ocean topography, the speed of travel size, tide. The tide is huge. In fact, paper after paper and talk after talk talks about how the hurricanes are going to be worse because of what? What sea thing do they talk about? Sea level rise. And I say that is nonsense because sea level rise is gradual. No matter how much it is, it's very gradual. So you're going to know long before the storm comes where that sea level starts. The thing that, that exacerbates the storm surge is the tide. So when a storm hits during a high tide and you can have tides of several feet 
you can have much more devastation. So all these things matter. You had Category 4 breath. Now, Category 4 is about like Eon was. In 1999, only $15 million, one death, versus Eon, $113 billion, 150 deaths. And then Katrina was only a Cat 3, you know, $108 billion and 1,800 deaths. Why? Because Hurricane Brett hit the least, pretty much the least populated area of um, – County of Kennedy. Oh, oh, that I guess that was the name of the county. But uh, you know, hit you could have made a direct hit on Corpus Christi, but it went in a very sparsely populated area. And it's the uh, tale of like two out of control trucks hitting a wall versus hitting a crowd. Very different impacts, and that's going to happen this year. If you go to the next slide, if we just talk about Andrew, my favorite storm since I went through it. Had my fourth child, my first girl, the night before Andrew. Uh, and uh, uh, my house was destroyed. And you can see that story somewhere. We should put that in the in the comments if you want. But uh, if it had just, what that slide on the left shows, the yellow is the area of devastation from Andrew. The red is the rest of the city of Miami. And basically, the top one is the property value. The bottom one is the population. So it showed that the worst winds of Andrew hit the, least, hit the least populated area of Dade County. If it would have been just 15, 20 miles to the north, it would just been three, four times as bad. And that's the exact same storm. And then you have storms of different uh, sizes. If you look at Floyd Dirt versus Andrew on the right-hand side, uh, this is the same scale. They're almost the exact same intensity, the same location. But look how much bigger area that Floyd would have affected. Floyd, it turned out, turned to the north, hit the Carolinas, had weakened to a Cat 1, and caused 100-year flooding events. Huge amount, huge amount of damage. And, yeah, I agree with uh, uh, Christine. It was a nightmare. And I'll put the uh, link, and they can put it on the screen if anyone wants to see my Andrew story. So thank you for letting me show these two sides. It's not just how strong. It's where it hits. And Eon hit an area that had a huge amount of buildup right on the beach and an area very prone to storm surge. So it's just the winds were not as strong as Andrew, but it just wiped it clean near the beach. Yeah. Andrew was such a uh, landmark event, not only in hurricane forecasting, but also in the way Doppler radar was first used with the WSR 88 uh, Doppler radar. It got its first use, real significant first use with Hurricane Andrew. Well, it and, destroyed, uh, Andrew destroyed the WSR-57 radar that was on top of the Hurricane Center building. Uh, yeah, there we, there we go. There's Stan the Man doing his forecasting with Alden fax charts. Remember those? Oh, please, please. And and the, the forecasts were coming out of printers and, and uh, it was all sorts of different things. But that's from a National Geographic special called Cyclone. And I gave, uh, I put the link there. Very simple link if people want to see that story. It's very interesting that after that story, it's just the hurricane portion of that special. My story starts about 10 minutes in. After they're done with Andrew, they mention what would have happened if Andrew had hit New Orleans. The, yeah. That special yeah. came out in 1995, 10 years later. Uh, yep. And an answer to Andrew, uh, Andy, I don't think you should play it, but you put the link for people there. If you want to play it, that's up to you. But uh, okay, yeah, let's put the link up for people to play it yeah, on their but own. Ten, but 10, 10 years later, Katrina hit. And Katrina caused that much damage, not necessarily because it was so strong. It was a Cat 3, but because of the levees in New Orleans. Just filled right. it up like a fishbowl. Right. But it still got blamed on climate change. And Al Gore came out right after Katrina and said, you know, hurricanes are going to get worse. They're going to get stronger and blah, 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 blah. And guess what? Right after that, we started the 11, I think it was 11 year hurricane drought for major hurricanes making landfall in the United States. And to put Al Gore and his forecast in his place. Absolutely. And and by the way, that was the year I had done two years interviews with Time Magazine. I mentioned this in my Orlando talk. Uh, we're very balanced view on why we're having more hurricanes. 2005 front cover story was, are we making hurricanes worse? And they was talking yeah, about, yeah, I remember that one. So they got to push. One. They, they, I'll tell you, they push, listen, I'm in this field. This is what I, you know, breathe and eat, uh, day and night. 
and the media pushes this narrative of climate change making hurricanes worse again and again and again and again. And yep. very few out there are willing to say the truth of the balanced narrative that we really have and what yep. the real science says. Balance is not something they like, especially when they're being paid $8 million to push climate narratives at the Associated Press. All right, let's get to our last question and see what we've got. Uh, we've got another good question. Take my pretty uh, picture off there. Oh, please. <laughs> All right, I'll take this one. I want to say about this one, about CERN or HARP, can it affect the weather? Listen carefully. Read my lips. No and hell no. <laughs> All right. Harp is one of these crazy, crazy conspiracy theory things about this, uh, this ionospheric research station in Alaska that puts out radio waves into the atmosphere, bounces them down to measure things going on in the ionosphere. It has a power of, you know, in the megawatts range, which sounds huge, but compared to the, gosh, petawatts in the atmosphere itself, it's a not, it's not even a drop of water in a bathtub. The amount of energy produced by HARP has no effect, zero, on the atmosphere. And plus that, they closed a station back about 10 years ago. And so, you know, Get that whole harp thing out of your mind. As far as CERN and the super collider and all that stuff, no, it's a, it's slamming atomic particles together and they're looking at things coming out. It's microscopic. It ha cannot affect the atmosphere. So I reiterate, no and hell no. There. <laughs> Listen, Anthony, I was at uh, our lab when they were doing weather modification experiments uh, with seeding. Uh, one of them was FACE. And by the way, Joanne Simpson was involved with that. And one of them was Project Storm Fury trying to seed the hurricanes. And I laugh. I had to fight with people this last summer who were claiming that Eon was made worse because of all this modification stuff. And I showed them the real data of what we had. Right, right. You know, in the only weather modification that I know goes on on a regular basis actually happens here in the Western United States, the Pacific Gas and Electric, you know, that uh, that electric company that burns whole towns down, um, they put up uh, propane generators on the top of the Sierra Nevada. They make propane crystals that go into the atmosphere at high elevations, and they help seed the clouds to produce more snow. That's the only weather for modification, successful weather modification that I know of that goes on in the uh, anywhere in the United States. Someone says the front door. <laughs> okay. Get... Oh, goody. It's Jehovah's Witnesses. Seriously. <laughs> oh, my goodness. All right. Well. <laughs> well, we got politics and religion on this call, I'll tell you. <laughs> oh, my goodness. All right. So I want to end this show with a prediction. Um, you know, we talked about how the media likes to take and hype things and how they like to hype hurricanes in particular. So I did a quick search while we were all talking for a phrase that I believe is going to make itself evident in the news media sometime in the next, let's say, five years. So here's my prediction. There's going to be a series of events that come together where, you know, climate is going to be blamed for a hurricane or a potential hurricane or a series of hurricanes or whatever it might be. There's going to be some event that's going to trigger this. And I guarantee you, the media will coin the phrase Climacane. Yes, it doesn't exist yet. I did a search, but Climacane will become the new buzzword for the media at some point in the not too distant future. Um, real quick before we end the show, though, I do want to mention that, uh, like Stan makes very clear in all of his, um, you know, hurricane talks and everything, preparation is key, you guys. So to all of our viewers who do live in the South, please don't be the person who has to rush to the gas station or rush to the grocery store when a hurricane is coming. You should probably try to be prepared before that. Um, keep your tank filled during hurricane season to the best of your ability. Uh, make sure that you have some water stocked up, all that good stuff. Um, preparation helps to dampen the blow a little bit as best as you can anyway. Um, Although you can't control the weather, you you can control how you respond to it. Listen, there's a good phrase. I'm glad we're I'm right. 
but, but that's true. I'm glad we're ending on this note because it is uh, hope for the best, prepare for the worst. Exactly. And maximize your preparedness to minimize your impact. That's an article I wrote on five keys of preparedness. He just stuck up there. But uh, there's plenty of good resources online. I'll give you a little hint. By the way, down here in Miami, when a storm is approaching, you have people panicking. They said, you know, the grocery store is out of water, out of water. And I look at them. I say, do you have a water faucet in your house? Do you have bottles you can fill up? I mean, I have a bunch of two liter bottles that I keep around and I fill them up before a hurricane, you know, so. Right. Uh, but there's lots that, of things. We could do a whole program of preparedness. Go ahead. I'm oh, sorry. yeah. No, and that would be a, a prepper show. That'd be pretty fun, too. <laughs> um, <laughs> the, uh, no, but, you know, you just you get some water bottles. If you know that, you know, forecasts are starting to talk about it or even at the beginning of the season, you can have water bottles frozen in the freezer ahead of time to keep it cold. All sorts of stuff like that. Um, and I'm sure that the FEMA website actually, uh, as far as preparedness goes, they do tend to put out some pretty good information about that. So. Listen, same with the Hurricane Center. Let me let right. me also make a closing comment. The most important site to go to during the hurricane season is hurricanes.gov. It's hurricanes, plural, dot G-O-V. Learn the National Hurricane Center site. Learn all the incredible amount of tools they have there and the discussions and and earliest arrival of tropical storm. There's just so much there when the storms come out. Uh, and I would thank you for putting that up there. That's what I really recommend to people. I would look at that before you listen to anything from the media. Get it right from the horse's mouth. Sorry that I called the forecasters horses, but get it right from the horse's mouth and, uh, and then go from there. Because some of the media guys get it right. I call them from time to time, commend them or rebuke them, and some get it wrong. But the Hurricane Center is going to give you some of the best information you can have. All right. That wraps it up for number 64 of Climate Change Roundtable. I want to appreciate, uh, give appreciation to everyone who's asked questions and who's contributed to the program. Special thanks to Stanley Goldenberg, our federal meteorologist on call and a hurricane expert to talk about hurricanes, and also to Linnea Lucan, who's provided some fantastic commentary and some great points. I want to thank you all for joining us today and thanks for staying with us through this extended edition. Remember, give us a like and subscribe to the channel and also visit our website, climaterealism.com, climateataglance.com, and also the new energyataglance.com. Take a look at those websites and make them part of your regular set of resources for arguing against climate craziness. For everyone here at the Heartland Institute, I'm Anthony Watts, Senior Fellow for Environment and Climate, wishing you a good day and a great holiday weekend. Bye-bye.